Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this Hub International and Inc. webinar, Not in Our Workplace, How to Prepare Your Employees and Company from Sexual Harassment. My name is China Gorman, and I will be your moderator today. My specialization is human capital management from the CEO perspective. And during my career, I've been the CEO of the Great Place to Work Institute, President of Lehigh Terrison, as well as Chief Operating Officer and Interim CEO of the Society for Human Resource Management. Now I work with employers, helping them understand and enhance their cultures to optimize their employees' potential. Today we're going to talk about sexual harassment in the workplace. A more timely topic probably could not be found because we're in the middle of a cultural shift and harassment is no longer being tolerated, tolerated minimized, or excused. This is really a, a period of rapid, turbulent change, but it really offers all of us an opportunity. Companies and organizations can use this societal dialogue as a starting point to create safer workplaces for employees, build a positive workplace culture that discourages sexual harassment, and protect their organizations from liability. To discuss these important issues, we've got a really distinguished lineup of speakers. Carrie Shveni is the Senior Vice President, Strategic Client Solutions at Hub International. She's got 20 years of employee relations experience providing human resources, employment law, and employee benefits legal guidance. Welcome, Carrie. Andrea Goodkin is Executive Vice President, Human Capital Consulting Practice Lead at Hub International. She's got 26 years of combined in-house human resource leadership and consulting experience across many diverse organizations. We're thrilled to have you here, Andrea. And Karen Samuels is Executive Vice President, Financial Products Practice Leader at Hub International. Karen has 30 years of experience overseeing management liability, insurance coverages, including employment practices and directors and officers liability. So welcome to the three of you and thank you for joining us today. Here's a quick look at our agenda. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about this seismic cultural shift that we're seeing, um, particularly in North America. We'll talk about protecting your employees and your company. We'll talk about compliance, culture, communication, and coverage, the four C's. And then we'll also talk specifically what do you do when a claim arises? So this seismic cultural uh, shift that we're experiencing is big. Sexual harassment is dominating the headlines, and according to recent research, it remains a big problem in U.S. workplaces. So we're going to start with a look at some numbers. But first, we're going to start with a poll. We'd like you all to take this poll. Um, what issues are you seeing in your organization pertaining to sexual harassment, particularly in the last six months? And as you start to answer, we will start to, to see some of the results. But the questions are, we're getting A, we're getting more questions about our company policy and procedures. B, we're hearing about behavior that may not be appropriate. C, we have received a complaint and or conducted an investigation, or D, none of which I am aware. And as you can see, we're seeing, we're seeing some folks sending their answers in, taking the poll. We'll wait just a few more minutes and, and we'll see um, what are some of the issues that you're seeing in your organization. We're um, most folks are not aware so far, most folks are not aware of issues of sexual harassment. And then the other three responses are fairly evenly distributed. So we'll take, we'll give just a couple more, um, a couple more seconds for your answers. Not everybody is participating yet. Um, so just a couple more seconds. So let me send these results to you. And you'll see that percentage of folks on the call, between 50 and 60%, are not aware of issues in the last six months. And then fairly evenly distributed amongst the, the rest of the call attendees are um, uh, pretty evenly distributed between we're getting more questions, 
we're hearing about behavior, um, and we've received a complaint and or conducted an investigation. And interestingly, that's the that's the lowest number. So just we'll, we'll be keeping that in mind as we as we go forward. So let's talk a little bit about some of the numbers um, that are out there. Um, according to a recent CNBC survey, 20% of employees have been harassed at work. And that's, if you think about it, that's a pretty staggering number. So Andrea, you're first up. Why do you think that so many companies have issues with sexual harassment? Something we've all thought about for sure. Thanks so much, China. You know, companies have issues with sexual harassment because something is going on in their workplace that allows it to occur. And that something could be any number or a combination of reasons. There can be misunderstandings about what constitutes sexual harassment, and this is both among employers and employees. And some workplace environments or cultures just simply provide more opportunities for harassment to thrive. And that 20% that number, it's actually a lot higher. And again, companies have issues with sexual harassment for a number of reasons. Employers might not establish policies or procedures um, because they don't think it will be a problem or that their company is too small or that one sexual harassment training session during onboarding is sufficient. Sometimes there's an imbalance of power across the company, and this can happen in very hierarchical organizations. And, and this imbalance can make employees feel less empowered to challenge or report inappropriate conduct. And these are real concerns because we know that sexual harassment in the workplace is vastly underreported, and as many as 75% of cases are never brought to management's attention. So oftentimes employees don't report sexual harassment because they're concerned that nothing will be done or they'll experience retaliation, and the numbers show that that's a legitimate fear because 75% of those who report harassment face some sort of reprisal. And the overall culture plays a really significant part here. In a permissive culture, which is one that allows inappropriate conduct to occur, employees often don't see an avenue uh, to affect change, and that bad behavior then goes unchecked. And, and few companies actually understand the widespread liability that extends throughout their organizations or how much it could really cost them. There, there's a lot in what you just said, Andrea. But let's start with your statement that a lot of employees and employers simply don't understand what constitutes sexual harassment. When we talk about it, people often reference Title VII. Carrie, you're our legal expert. Can you walk us through Title VII, what it is and what it means? Absolutely. So thanks, China and Andrea. It, it's extremely important that the folks on the phone understand that bad practice, bad behavior, violations of policy aren't always illegal behavior in violation of Title VII. Um, Title VII specifically says that you cannot harass or discriminate people against people based on a particular protected class. For example, sex, race, color, the items listed here. Other protected classes include things like sexual orientation in some cases, pregnancy, and age discrimination. What matters here, guys, is if you've got an individual in the workplace who's just kind of a jerk to everyone in the workplace, they're what we refer to as an equal opportunity jerk. And an equal opportunity jerk isn't necessarily violating Title VII or breaking the law. So what does an adverse employment action look like? What does that mean? An adverse employment action can be termination, failure to hire, demotion, other kinds of adverse employment actions can be reassignment to the quote-unquote dirty job, failure to promote, a lot of the things that we know and understand that are part of the employment relationship. It's also important to understand that Title VII in particular applies to employers or organizations with 15 or more employees. So for the folks on the phone that are small employers, it's still important that you learn and understand harassment because later you'll hear other forms of liability that can be triggered by that kind of bad behavior. So based on that, Carrie, can you provide us with a working legal definition of sexual harassment? Absolutely. I'm so glad that you asked, China. Um, there are essentially <laughs> two forms of sexual harassment in the workplace. There's quid pro quo and there's hostile work environment. Quid pro quo is exactly what it sounds like, this for that, go on a date, you get a raise, 
um, engage in a particular kind of inappropriate conduct and you may get a bonus. That's not quite as common, although we hear about it more often, not quite as common as hostile work environment. And hostile work environment is based on the premise that the behavior is so individually severe or so pervasive on an ongoing pattern or practice basis that it violates Title VII. Of course, it's based on a protected class. Um, mental breakdown or, or nervous breakdown is not necessarily the standard here, right? Hostile work environment doesn't have to be so severe or pervasive that you actually get driven to a mental breakdown. It, it really is behavior that interferes with work performance. It creates an intimidating environment or an office work environment. The, the bad actors associated with hostile work environment could be an employee or could be a third party. And a lot of people don't understand that non-employees still can create liability and obligations on behalf of the employer when it comes to sexual harassment, hostile work environment, et cetera. And that's really one of many sort of interesting myths, right, about what is and what isn't um, sexual harassment. So speaking of myths, can you talk about some of the common ones? We see three Absolutely. here. Absolutely. I think that um, understanding what sexual harassment is is as important as understanding what it is not. And I'm not going to read all of these to you, but there's a couple in the next two slides that I think are particularly important to talk about. Myth number one is that harassment can only take place between a man and a woman. There's a great Supreme Court case on this called On Cale versus Sundowner. And in that case, you had an all-male population on an oil rig engaging in all kinds of behavior that, that the imagination can conjure up, towels snapping and jokes and all kinds of language that, that we won't get into on this call. Um, but one of the men in that workforce raised their hand and said, hey, this isn't appropriate. I don't like it. I'm not comfortable. Um, I feel like this is sexual harassment and brought a claim against his employer. This case went all the way to the Supreme Court. Can't even imagine what that legal bill looked like. And the Supreme Court said, you're right. Sexual harassment is all about behavior, not necessarily about whether or not you're in the same protected class, meaning it can happen between a man and a woman, a woman and a woman, or a man and a man. Um, the next myth that I think is important is our sixth myth, which is no, if the employee did not say no, it's not harassment. And guys, there's just no magic words here, right? It's about the substance of the behavior. And we go back to our definition. Was the behavior severe or pervasive? Was it quid pro quo? And if the answer to any of that is yes, it's a little like Jeff Foxworthy. You'll hear me reference him a few times. I'm a big fan. Um, then it's sexual harassment. So no is not required. There's no magic words here. So really, at the end of the day, what we're talking about is the liability for employers. And you guys are doing the right thing by being on this call, learning and understanding the various aspects of liability, because not knowing and not understanding could be catastrophic for employers. So catastrophic is a, is a big word. Can you help us understand the potential financial ramifications of a sexual harassment claim? Karen, you're our, you're our guru on this regard. What are we talking about in terms of damages and costs? Sure. Um, thanks, China. Well, I mean, the cost can be quite significant, and some companies may not survive a claim, um, whether because of the financial costs or reputational impacts. And I would say at a minimum, cases that are settled out of court will range somewhere between $75,000 and $125,000, but um, those that go to trial could be well into the millions of dollars when all is said and done. So really when you are considering the cost, you have to look at both the monetary and the non-monetary, certainly potential fines, settlements, uh, possible amounts for the potential of punitive damages, and then loss in productivity, increase in absenteeism, and other um, factors that fall into play w in workplaces where harassment is thriving. 
Also, the effects of overall employee morale need to be considered, and of course, uh, the damage to the company's reputation, and if that's something that they can survive. Yeah, those are all really super important um, considerations, and that's an awful lot of liability in all kinds of corners and crevices in an organization. So, Carrie, who primarily is at risk when harassment occurs? So, China, as a very, as as a lawyer, my answer will have to be it depends. <laughs> um, unfortunately, that, that actually is the real answer too. So, when it comes to organizations and individual liability under Title VII, in particular. The liability for individuals really depends on the jurisdiction. Some jurisdictions say liability for Title VII violations actually absolutely sit only with the organization and the entity itself. In other jurisdictions, bad actors, employees, leadership may or may not be on the hook. Um, and so it, it really depends on where you sit. From an organizational liability standard, the, the first threshold question is whether or not the company knew or should have known about the behavior and then the next inquiry is whether or not there was a tangible employment action taken we are going to talk at great length about this concept of tangible employment action and liability so stay tuned we're going to talk about that in a couple of minutes from individual liability i really want to talk briefly about the concept of tort action and a tort is a claim brought at the state level against an individual for something like assault and battery false imprisonment intention intentional infliction of emotional distress. These are all theories of law that attach to people, not companies. And so there are kinds of claims out there that could exist separate from Title VII that could attach to individual employees. Wow, that that's actually pretty scary. Um, so protecting your employees and your company becomes a really critical piece. It's, it's, it's that HR balancing act, right? And in my work, I've found that companies that tend not to have problems with sexual harassment are the ones that take a really comprehensive approach to thwarting it, frankly. Um, there are four key components to a comprehensive um, sexual harassment protection program, but before we get to those, I'd like to I'd like to hear from our audience again. We have we have over 1,100 folks on the line, so we have another poll opportunity. How would you describe your company's policies and procedures for dealing with sexual harassment? So here's the survey. Uh, Melissa, I'm trying to get to. Here's the new survey. Sorry. Uh, how would you describe your company's policies and procedures for dealing with sexual harassment? A, I'm sending it to you now. A, our policy is comprehensive and we have clear protocols for investigations. B, we have a policy and investigation protocol, but we're not sure if it's comprehensive. C, we don't have adequate policies and procedures. So. Um, I'm hoping you can all see the survey and that you are starting to uh, answer whether you have a comprehensive policy, whether we have a policy but not sure if it's comprehensive, or we don't have adequate policies and procedures. So we've got um, a very small portion of our um, attendees taking the survey at this point. Um, this is a really interesting question, I think, um, given the days that we live in and the, the kind of attention that's being played off in the media and elsewhere around sexual harassment and, it, and its pervasiveness um, in our workplaces. Um, so the good news, as I, as I look at how the survey responses are coming in, um, we have policies and investigation protocol, but we're not sure if it's comprehensive. Seems to be taking the lead with almost 50% of our, our respondents, and we've got, we've got a, a, a good number of respondents now. Um, only 13.5% of, of the folks on the, on the line say we don't have adequate policies and procedures, so that's, that's actually, actually pretty good news. I'm going to send you the results now. 
hopefully you can hopefully you can see those. And um, I will go back back to our presentation. And if you got out of the presentation, you should go back to the slides now um, as we're going to as we're going to move move forward. Um, we're, we're talking now about the four key components. Um, and so we've got a little tricky uh, four C's here. Um, compliance. So the compliance piece is you have a strong anti-sexual harassment policy, reporting po protocols, investigation methods, and they're in keeping with federal, state, and local laws. And as we know, um, that lattice work can be trickier by the day. The second C is culture. You've developed trust-based cultures where employees are discouraged, or where employees discourage bad behavior among themselves. So there's a self-policing element there. Communication, um, clear expectations are set about how employees will interact, what the policies are, and other key messages. This is important from a CEO and a senior leadership perspective. And then coverage, the real nitty-gritty of um, organizations protect their companies by working with L with HR, with legal, and with insurance experts to minimize the risk, incorporate best practices and prevention, and close the gaps um, in coverage. So let's take a look at each of these four C's and let's get started with the with the compliance piece. And Carrie, it would be great if you would carry this this ball forward. Um, and and talk about the legal sides of things. Absolutely, I'm always happy to do that. Um, so many of you <laughs> may have heard of, or, or may not have heard of, but you 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 will be versed in it by the time I'm through with you. The Farragher Ellis defense, <laughs> and this is a a defense that essentially lets the employer um, get out of the litigation, so to speak without actually having to defend on the merits of the claim. But as you can imagine, that's a really big deal to be, able to be able to exit litigation. And so there's some very specific criteria that must be in place before you can take advantage of this complete affirmative defense. And that threshold criteria before you even move through the substance of the defense is whether or not a tangible adverse employment action has been taken against the individual. Remember I said earlier, this is a special category of information that we have to talk about. If an adverse, a tangible adverse employment action has been taken against the individual, then you do not pass go, you do not move forward, you do not get to take advantage of this affirmative defense. So what is it? discharge, demotion, failure to promote, a lot of the adverse employment actions that we already talked about under Title VII. So what are the additional criteria if no tangible adverse employment action has been taken? Well, there's a two-prong analysis, as we like to say in the legal world, around this affirmative defense. One is, as the employer, did you take reasonable care to prevent and promptly correct the behavior? And did the employee fail to take advantage of those preventative or corrective opportunities. So what does that mean? Reasonable care is a really big phrase, guys. It means you've got a policy, which we're gonna talk about. You've got a complaint procedure, which we're gonna talk about. And you've done the right things to educate, train, and publish that policy. So we're gonna talk about that in detail as well. So first I wanna talk about some of those important policy considerations. As a threshold matter, as a good attorney, I'm always going to tell you to talk to a lawyer. It's very important that you partner with counsel to review your policy, ensure that it complies with local, federal, state law, ensure that you enforce that policy consistently, and connect with your EPLI carrier. A, it's always good that the EPLI carrier believes in what you're doing, but B, having those great preventative, strong policies in advance can be really helpful with respect to your employment practices liability insurance, which Karen's going to talk about in a minute on our next slide. But first, I want to give you a little bit more insight into what should be in your actual sexual harassment policy. So as a threshold matter, that policy that you're building in your handbook is really an anti-harassment, non-discrimination policy. Remember I said in the beginning of the presentation that harassment and discrimination on the basis of any protected class is going to be illegal. So you want your policies 
to really address anti-harassment and non-discrimination in the workplace period. You want a strong complaint procedure, a complaint procedure that gives the employee options to go beyond their supervisor because so often, right, the supervisor is, is the person being accused, but you don't want it so broad that you run the risk that someone in the organization is on notice of the complaint but didn't do the right thing, raise their hand and go to human resources. So you really need a balance in that complaint procedure. And this is why working with counsel to build your program is so important because counsel will help you identify that right balance. Equally important is that the consequences are built into the program, that an anti-retaliation, no retaliation statement is built in that program. And if you have a union, really be sure that you synchronize your anti-harassment, non-discrimination policy, and your regular employee handbook with your collective bargaining agreement. Connected to all of this, guys, I said earlier, you gotta, you gotta tie back to your employment practices, liability insurance, and to your carrier, and Karen's gonna talk a bit about that. Thanks, Carrie. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a, you're always operating from a position of defense, and it's very important that you take a proactive stance. But just for clarification and everyone's understanding, the Employment Practices Liability Insurance Policy is the contract that's going to protect the entity and the named individuals that are insured. It's going to provide coverage for defense costs as well as losses that will result from a variety of employment-related claims. And we've touched on some of these, but it can include allegations of discrimination, sexual harassment, retaliation, wrongful termination, also neg negligent supervision, wrongful infliction of emotional distress, um, hostile work environments, and of, co of course, uh, humiliation. So you really want to make sure that you are looking closely at your insurance, and we'll get into some more detail on that momentarily. Wow, thanks for that. That, um, that spells it out pretty, pretty clearly, and we will come back to some of these. Um, let's talk a little bit about culture and the role that it plays in creating an environment that either creates and, and magnifies bad behavior or, or nips it in the bud. Andrea, um, I think we understand intuitively that having a strong positive culture is the best way to prevent workplace harassment, but what are we talking about when we discuss culture? And then how does that happen? Thanks, China. You know, culture is your company's character. It's, it's the personality. An organizational culture is defined by how people interact with each other. And some hallmarks of a really strong positive culture include leaders who are trustworthy and fair, a culture that provides for the ability to give and receive feedback. It's one with really clear channels of communication. And this is an organization where people actually talk to one another. Uh, it's one that allows for and values employee contributions. And uh, you know, people feel like they have a voice and their opinions and concerns matter. It's an environment of ongoing coaching, employee development and goal setting, and there's a sense of community where employees really talk to one another. And when all of these elements come together, they create an environment where employees feel comfortable talking about a problem when it does arise. And this helps to discourage sexual harassment. So what if you don't have this type of culture now? And a lot of times employers may think, you know, this is the culture that we were dealt. I guess it's the culture that we have today. And I genuinely disagree with this. Um, you know, we work with clients all the time on ways to identify the culture that they aspire to have and put measures in place to achieve that healthier culture. And we know that leaders can change culture by really being a part of ongoing conversations and regularly giving and receiving feedback, by studying their culture and employee attitudes and paying attention to what needs to be fixed, focusing on employee development, being approachable, and more than anything, it's exhibiting the right behaviors. And ensuring that employees are comfortable bringing forth an issue or a problem is so important, and training plays a significant part here. And Carrie is uh, she's going to talk a little bit more about the critical role of training. Carrie. Thanks, Andrea. So training is an incredibly important component, not just of your important legal defense, right? I said earlier that we were going to talk about training as part of that farragher Ellerth affirmative defense. But to Andrea's point, communication and opening up those doors of understanding, education, and communication with your team are absolutely imperative 
to really addressing harassment in the workplace of any form. So there's really three kinds of training that you should provide to your workforce. The first is your employee training. Employee training is the training that you provide to your regular employee population around the policy, their rights, and the complaint procedure. Manager training is the second category of folks that you should be providing training to. And for manager training, it should be all of the above, right? Policy, rights, complaint procedure, plus those manager special obligations. These managers need to know and understand the special place that they hold in the organization as a manager. They are an agent of the organization. They can bind the company, they can obligate the company, and they can create liability for themselves and the employer. So manager training is very important. And then the folks who are inside of that pool of people who are eligible to receive the complaints, the people listed in that complaint procedure, they need all of the other training that I've already mentioned on top of how to be, how to receive, how to be in that pool of people eligible to receive a complaint. What do they do when they get a complaint? How do they respond? What questions should they ask? Who should they communicate with inside of the organization? We're going to put these folks in quite a hot seat if they receive a complaint, so we better be sure we teach them how to handle it and how to be responsive. Additionally, the content of your training is extremely important. So it's not enough to simply pull down a slide deck from some website somewhere or, or buy a generic program with generic decks and generic information about sexual harassment because what aren't we doing? We're missing that important customized training about your policy, your preventative measures, your complaint procedure. So generic mass training, not good. It's absolutely essential that your content is built and customized for your organization. So the training piece, together with the culture piece is, is really super, super critical. Um, and communication, the, the third C and our four Cs, is also a really critical part. Um, it comes from trust that leaders um, engender and, and create within, within the workplace. Um, Andrea, you have a really interesting way of looking at this, I think, and you say there are two types of communication above the line and below the line. Would you kind of go into detail on that for us? Absolutely. Uh, above the line communications, these are things that we can see. These are newsletters and policies and training like what Carrie just described, handbooks, email blasts, posters. These are things that we put out to inform and enlighten people about our policies and expectations. But let's talk about below the line communications. Below-the-line communications are, are critical, and culture is a learned behavior, and we create organizational culture by our actions. So below-the-line communications are the behaviors that we exhibit. These are the meaningful actions, employee interactions, leadership modeling, which is critical, interpersonal communication, respectful dialogue, enforcement procedures, consequences. And bystander behavior is extremely important. Well-trained bystanders are better equipped to stop harassment and encourage professional behavior. And the key point here is that we can put out, you know, above the line communications all day long, but if we're not modeling it in our behavior, it simply won't stick. And leaders shape the culture through their behavior. And culture change begins when leaders start to exhibit the types of behaviors that the organization wants to embody. You know, I was, I was at a conference just yesterday and we talked a significant amount about how important it is for leaders to embody the culture and the values of the organization. It's all hype and it's all wannabe if we say one thing and act in another way. So I think this is, this is a really critical, um, a critical piece. Our fourth C, um, now we're getting into sort of the, the nitty gritty. Our fourth C is coverage. Um, here's what happens sometimes. Despite our best effort, a claim arises. And in that case, having the right insurance can be an essential part of protecting both your people um, and your organization. So Karen, what do leaders need to think about when, em when purchasing employment practices liability coverage, particularly with regards to sexual harassment? 
Well, definitely you want to start with making sure that you're purchasing broad employment practices liability insurance. It's very important to remember that not all of these insuring contracts are created equally. So you really have to take into consideration each company's unique exposures and the coverage that the marketplace has available to address those specific risks. Um, you're going to have to consider who needs to be included as an insured under the policy and also pay close attention to all of the definitions um, because this is really one of the most important segments of the insuring contract. So for example, within the definitions, you'll want to make sure that as it relates to discrimination and harassment, all forms or types of har harassment and discrimination are included within the policy language. And you absolutely will want to purchase an employment practices liability policy that includes third-party protection and focus on the definition of wrongful act. Um, this item in particular is going to contain the majority of acts that will or will not trigger coverage under your policy. So the bottom line is really that you do not want to skimp on coverages. You have to examine the wording and all of the various provisions and work very closely with your insurance advisor to make sure that you understand how that insuring contract will behave in the event of a claim. Um, focusing a little bit more on the types of coverages that you want to look for, since Punitive damages are very often a component of EPL claims. It's very important to make sure that this is included in the definition of loss. You'll probably also want to look for most favorable venue wording. This will allow some flexibility on where the matter is adjudicated because in some states, punitive damages are not insurable. Also, you have to pay very close attention to exclusions and try to avoid any exclusions for intentional acts, uh, reduction in force or mass layoff exclusions, um, or even some policies that would include exclusions for class action lawsuits. Um, I mentioned earlier third-party liability. This is going to be coverage that is will respond to claims by non-employees, so this could be claims that come from your clients, vendors, or any person or visitor that's not an employee of your company. So if you're an organization that frequently deals with the public, you're certainly going to have a heightened exposure for third-party liability. Um, some industry classes where this is absolutely essential is anyone that's in the hospitality industry, healthcare, professional firms, retail, education, um, you know, just to name a few, but absolutely these are all areas that you want to look closely at. And if you also need to take into consideration who is going to be an insured under your policy and who fits the definition of employee. So if you utilize independent contractors, be sure that they're included. And the same for volunteers, particularly for nonprofits, educational institutions, or even healthcare risks uh, would want to be sure that if they utilize volunteers that they have coverage for that type of risk. And then finally, um, I really think it's important to consider additional coverage, uh, especially for owners, directors, and officers with all of the heightened awareness and all of the information out there. A lot of these allegations are spawning into other types of claims under uh, directors and officers insurance where certain other executives have been negligent or have turned a blind eye to various types of misconduct. Boy, that's a, that's a lot to look for and it's a, it's a lot to, to negotiate. Um, let's, let's talk about next. Um, what to do when a claim arises, right? This is, this is really where the rubber meets the road and when a claim does arise, it's too late to start figuring out how you want to do what you need to do next. You have to know in advance how to respond. So Carrie, would you kind of walk us through these aspects? Absolutely. So of course the first thing that I'm going to talk to you about is talking to outside counsel. And I know that that seems to be my canned and standard response, but guys, I can't tell you how many times I had clients walk in my door, so to speak, with active 
charges of discrimination or, or worse, even litigation against them. And if only I had been able to get involved sooner, I would have been able to work with the employer to help them better position themselves for a, a stronger and better defense or at least more leverage in trying to settle and, and leave the claim behind and move on with their lives. So oftentimes working with outside counsel can be really instrumental in building your long-term strategy to shut this thing down as quick and as soon as possible at the least amount of expense. Additionally, privilege may be really important. Privilege is a concept that says everything I say to my attorney pursuant to defending myself in this claim or this litigation or this action is between me and my lawyer and it can't be admitted to court and it can't be used as evidence against me because I have to be able to speak to my attorney freely and openly so that I can better understand you know, how to, how to defend my organization or defend myself. And so working with counsel is really, really important. Additionally, you also need to check your EPLI insurance and talk to your broker. There are timing requirements around EPLI claims and insurance claims, and you want to make sure that you timely claim and don't lose coverage because you waited too long to tell the carrier what was going on. Um, but in addition to, to these really what I call the threshold steps in dealing with and responding to a claim, there are other considerations that are really important for your organization, and Andrea is going to talk us through some of those. Thanks, Carrie. Well, ideally, you have uh, you ha you already have a clear anti-sexual harassment policy and pr procedure for reporting in place. And um, you know, from there, as Carrie said, you need to involve your attorney uh, and broker throughout the process to ensure that legal compliance and proper insurance coverage is is being well managed. But now let's actually get into it and talk about actually receiving a complaint. And you know, the first thing is you really need to listen with care and document as much as possible about the specific incident. You never want to require that the complaint be submitted in writing, um, and you want to let the employee know that your organization does not tolerate retaliation and that any retaliatory behavior should be reported immediately. You also want to assign a point of contact uh, to you know, corral and manage this process. You don't ever want that point of contact to be the employee's supervisor because frequently that person may be involved in the complaint either as an accused or as a witness. Um, for this point of contact, a lot of times you want to consider a neutral third party, such as your attorney or a representative from your insurance organization and um, never promise confidentiality. This is a really tough one because, um, uh, you know, in our hearts we want to do this, we want to preserve confidentiality, but in reality it is virtually impossible to, uh, to maintain confidentiality with the investigation information, and so it's really important to make sure that as you're having these initial conversations, you're, you're you know, very transparent about the, the, the lack of your ability to keep this information especially confidential, um, and you want to notify the accused that a complaint has been filed. Um, you know, let them know. It's very important um, to do this and also to remind, uh, to remind them that retaliation is not tolerated. And Carrie, I know you have a couple of additional comments comments that we'd welcome here. I do. Um, on the point of confidentiality, I just want to remind everybody or, or bring to your attention that the National Labor Relations Board has something to say about investigations and confidentiality. And even if you're not a union shop, this applies. Very important to know that. Um, and under the National Labor Relations Act, employees have the right to talk about terms and conditions of employment. Um, and that includes the ability and the freedom to talk about workplace harassment, discrimination, and investigation. So you definitely want to work with outside counsel if you want to try to keep an investigation confidential. The other thing that's very important are the details. Andrea talked about listening carefully, step number two. Guys, the only thing I can promise you is to expect to be unexpected. Your investigations will more than likely take you down paths that you did not expect. So it's extremely important that you get the details and the facts as you do your intake and investigation. Sometimes they'll cooperate, sometimes they'll conflict, and sometimes they may raise additional issues in the workplace. And it's better that you find out the, the additional issues on your own rather than learning about it in deposition or through other kinds of testimony. The other thing that I want to make very, I want to highlight really is the neutrality that assign a contact step 
the, the plaintiff's counsel or the other side, depending on where you are in the process, will likely make a claim that all of these legitimate actions that you took and all of your policies and everything that you've done to try to do the right thing is all merely pretext. And it's all hiding what we call your discriminatory animus or your ulterior motive, which is to go out and really discriminate against people of a protected class. So it's really important that you have somebody who's very neutral sitting in the middle of this entire process to ensure that you've got true legitimacy and have a strong basis to um, really negate that argument that what you're doing is just pure pretext. And Andrea is going to cover a few more essential points when it comes to handling a complaint when it comes in. Yep, thanks, Carrie. Um, so just continuing on through the process, uh, you want to review your investigation process with everybody that's going to be involved in the investigation process and remind them about the anti-retaliation issue um, and, and because you're going to be asking them for their view of what happened. You'll then interview all of the individuals involved, including witnesses to any events or those circumstances. Ideally, you'll conduct all interviews with two people so that there's a witness to what was said. You want to get as many specifics as possible and be sure to keep detailed notes. And in terms of retaining these notes, um, we always advise uh, that, that you, you know, work with your legal counsel in terms of records retention around any sort of investigation. There are a lot of different timelines depending on um, how the, the situation resolves itself, uh, the length of time and whatnot. At a minimum, you want to retain that information for as long as the employee uh, remains employed, a minimum of one year beyond that. But again, work with your counsel regarding all of the records that you've accumulated through the process. And then after you're done collecting all of the information and conducting the investigation, you want to evaluate everything that you've gathered, assess it from a reasonable person's perspective, and you'll come to your conclusions based on the facts and what you've been able to corroborate across the witnesses. And then you'll write the report. And this is an original report that includes a conclusion and consequences, if any. Please don't use a rubber stamp report. You want to make it as detailed and customized for the specific events in the situation. You want to avoid editorializing and really use kind of a just the facts tone. And then at the end of the process, you want to communicate this conclusion to those involved. And Carrie, I know you've got a few additional comments here as well. I do, and, and I'm going to make this really concise, guys. This report can make or break your defense. It may or may not be discoverable. Um, the report and all of the supporting evidence may be terrific for your defense and something that you choose to release to the other side. But this is why it's so important that we go full circle, begin with the end in mind, and always involve counsel so you can make a claim of privilege on the investigation work product if you need to, or at least attempt to make that claim of privilege. Because depending on the contents of that report, how it's written, and the findings, like I said, it can make or break your defense. So I think these last two slides and the, this discussion is the gold in this whole experience, in this whole webinar. This step-by-step -step was so important. And if an organization has never had to deal with a claim, this is just the perfect roadmap. So thanks to both of you for, for putting that um, together. Um, Karen, so we talked a little bit about insurance brokerage um, support. How can a company's insurance broker be a resource to help protect against sexual harassment and its fallout? Well, at a minimum, I mean, the broker should be able to evaluate the company's specific exposures and offer coverage solutions to not just safeguard cor corporate assets, but also individuals um, and those that might even have some personal uh, liability tied to these types of claims. Um, at Hub, we would certainly be able to offer this type of advice and consultation. And then to complement the risk assessment, um, you know, and I, I guess Andrea can speak to this more, certainly review some of the HR policies, procedures, compliance, and, and workplace culture that exists and provide recommendations in that regard. Andrea, did you want to detail some of that? Yeah, thanks, Karen. You know, we do a lot of workplace culture. Our team does a lot of workplace culture consulting. 
um, helping to evaluate your culture and addressing issues that, that can leave a business you know, more open to sexual harassment. Um, and uh, I, our team of consultants, we, we do a lot of work in the area of best practices and compliance audits, engagement surveys, employee development, leadership, coaching, um, you know, uh, really all points along that employee life cycle that influence or are influenced by culture. And that's, you know, as a, as an, as a corporate culture expert of a kind, um, you can really trace leadership behavior and values and culture um, to almost any thing good that happens in an organization and almost anything untoward that happens in an organization. And particularly while the spotlight is being shined on sexual harassment in the workplace, um, I, th I think the, the focus on culture and the focus on leadership behavior is exactly, um, is exactly on point. Um, we've covered a lot of ground in the last um, 50 minutes. And so what I'd like to do is have each of our speakers give a very brief, and because we do want to answer a couple of the questions that you've, you've um, sent forward, very quickly have, have each of our speakers um, do a quick, a quick recap takeaway um, as we head into answering a couple, of, a couple of your questions. So Andrea, final thoughts on culture and communication? You bet. You know, corporate culture or the personality of the company, it really is the essence of the employee experience in good times and in bad. And creating the right corporate culture will do more than just avert a sexual harassment crisis. It will set the right tone for the entire organization. That's brilliant. Carrie, final thoughts on preventing legal liability, including creating policies and handling complaints appropriately. So no one's going to be surprised with my suggestion, and that is absolutely <laughs> work with outside counsel, work with your HR consultants. Andrea and her team are amazing. Guys, an ounce of prevention is absolutely worth a pound of cure. I would argue many, many pounds of cure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And Karen, final thoughts on being prepared for the EPLI underwriting process. What's the multifaceted approach that's necessary? Well, I definitely think it, it probably can't be stated enough. Um, you hit the nail on the head, China. There is a huge awareness out there, and all buyers of insurance, especially for employment practices liability, should be prepared for heightened underwriting scrutiny. Um, it's important to make sure that you work closely with your broker, understand the coverages that are out there that best fit your unique exposures. And if you've had claims, be able to tell how you've learned from past mistakes. Probably no one can tell your story better than you can if you're engaged and you're being proactive. Well, to our three speakers, thank you so much. I feel like I've just taken a four-credit course <laughs> in, in the organizational um, how not to do it and how to do it. Um, in terms of sexual harassment. So we do actually have a couple of minutes and we have, a, we have a number of questions that have been pouring in. And so to, our, to, our, uh, to the folks who are, are with us today, thank you for these questions. And obviously we won't get to all of them, but, but here, are, here are a couple. Um, so do you recommend companies have prepared public policy statements for media related inquiries given you know the the media value of these kinds of of complaints in today's world if if you do recommend that what should what should be in one who who should who among our three speakers should take this Karen well, as far as uh, the media responses or any type of PR, I think um, I would echo some of Carrie's remarks earlier. The most important person you want to speak to, first and foremost, is your attorney before you make any public comments about any matters. And then also tie in some coordination with your insurance carrier in a very timely fashion. Got it. Got it. That's great. Um, one of the one of the questions is more of a comment, but maybe we could get a quick discussion going. And the comment is: 
Don't forget to mention the distraction the allegation has on the day-to-day -day running of the business. Um, you're right, it, it's virtually impossible to keep these kinds of allegations or complaints confidential. People know, people start to talk, and it becomes an incredible diversion um, and an, an incredible um, distraction. So how do you, from, and maybe Andrea, this, is, this one is to you, how do you manage all the internal communication um, as one of these things plays out in an organization? Yeah, absolutely. And this gets back to um, one of the points in our process, which is identifying an individual to really own and lead that um, investigation process, if you will, um, because they they do, you know, uh, get very complex and and um, start to impact all corners of the organization. And so that's where, as you recall through the steps, communicating very clearly and thoughtfully to the um, individuals involved, making sure that um, anyone who may be impacted by what's going on or you know, on a need-to-know basis have information so that um, they can respond to questions that come up out in the workforce and really work to thoughtfully and sensitively contain the information. These um, investigations and the, the content, it's very, very sensitive, um, and so it does need to be well-maintained. And to the specific question about, you know, the the distraction in the workforce, if you will. Um, again, um, it, it having an individual who's responsible for really keeping their arms around that process and being very dialed into um, how it's impacting not only the investigation process itself, but individuals, you know, you know, orbiting around it. It's really critical, and that's the best way to keep things minimized. Got it. So here's an interesting question, and, and uh, Carrie, we're kind of talking offline about this, so I'll, so I'll kick it to you. Um, the question um, or comment maybe is, many women in various um, organizations called hardworking fathers or men as old white boys or the boys club openly in many events and at many conferences. Isn't that sexual harassment? As a man, I ignore it because we get a lot of work to do. Um, we've got a lot of work to do. So that's, a, that's an interesting sort of flip of the coin, um, other side of the, of, the, uh, of the dynamic, of the male-female dynamic. Carrie, what, what do you think about that? So it's a really great question, and I, it brings me right back to the beginning of our presentation, so we've gone full circle. And it's important to remember that Title VII is not a general civility code. In, in fact, the Supreme Court has said that over and over again in various cases on Cal versus Sundower Downer, which is obviously one of my more favorite cases. Um, the court said that explicitly. And what that means is bad behavior, off-color comments, inappropriate comments may break policy, but it doesn't necessarily rise to the level of sexual harassment. Remember our standards, it's either quid pro quo severe, meaning all by itself, on its own, it's so severe it constitutes sexual harassment, or pervasive, meaning the cumulative effect or the ongoing effect is in total so intrusive and so offensive that it interferes with the employee's ability to actually do their job come to work. It doesn't bring you to nervous breakdown, but that, that ongoing pattern of behavior actually inhibits or interferes with or impacts your ability to do your job. So it's important to remember that bad behavior and violations of company policy are not necessarily illegal, but human resources should stay on top of it and should address these kinds of issues, comments, and discussions in the workplace because it's a slippery slope and you don't want to end up in a position where you're talking to attorneys instead of addressing behavior internally. Great, that's really helpful. So one last question. Um, does EPLI include managers and lower level leads um, in their in their coverage? So um, Karen, can you give us some some thoughts on that? Is, is EPLI just covered directors and the C-suite or does it does it cover everybody? It should cover everyone, China. Um, a good policy is going to include all employees um, and there's there may be some restrictions as to independent contractors and that should be addressed on the front end and it can easily be endorsed onto the policy if needed 
so that that's really I think that's really helpful and a and a good thing for folks to know. So one last question: um, Most EPL carriers provide free. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm at, I'm I'm looking at the um, uh, at, at an answer. Um, and let me let me get to this question. Um, what about panel counsel? You said to contact outside counsel ASAP, but making sure a client doesn't incur legal fees that aren't reimbursable because they started using outside counsel instead of engaging panel counsel is a, is critical. What what exactly does does that mean, Karen? Well, um, as th there are many organizations that are going to have an attorney that they frequently use. You do want to be careful. Certain policies of insurance will specifically state that if you incur any expenses for um, legal counsel without the carrier's prior consent, they may not reimburse you for those fees. So you want to fully utilize um, anything that's available to you under the policy. Many good policies that are out there will also have a hotline or a login where you can speak to a pre-approved panel attorney about certain incidents when they arise. And some organizations will utilize that and they will also speak to uh, potentially one of their own outside attorneys and they might choose to pay those expenses um, themselves anyway just because it's a trusted advisor to them. But there's certainly resources that can be utilized from your policy um, and you should check there first. Well, that, that's really specific, and thanks, thanks so much for that. And, and thanks to our, to our three panelists, and thanks to Hub Inc. for sponsoring this um, Inc. webinar. Um, if you've been taking notes, know that, and you're still on the line, know that you will um, get the presentation at the end. Um, and we do ask, please, to fill out the evaluation form that we will send to you. Um, I feel way smarter than I did when we started this call, um, and I hope all of our all of our um, participants and attendees feel the same way. Thank you so much for dialing in. Thank you for spending an hour of your precious time with us to consider this really um, difficult these days topic and to help prepare you for what may come in your organization. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon.